and old old friend, and he is one of my early mentors. He taught me a lot of mathematical economics and a lot of uh, interesting stuff. He introduced me to science fiction, I can remember. Asar Galer um, is, um, I can close this person that I'm going to a polymath. He reads a lot, he understands a lot, he's a great argumentator, and he um, is, uh, as I said, he um, dabbled in economics and wrote some very interesting stuff in economics a long time ago. He used to be a collaborator with PAD. I think you've given up your interest in economics since then. I have put it aside. Put it aside, you know. Uh, so now he's come up with a lovely book in which, and we are dying to hear about it. Um, he and his collaborator, sorry, I must have used your name, sorry. Imran Parveer, you're a physicist too? Uh, a mathematician. Mathematician, okay, my God, must, must talk to you more. So, Imran Paresa has done this book with us. So, he promises me it's physics for the layman. So, is that right? Am I right with that? Sorry? It's physics for the layman, this book. It's so not very technical. Topology. Huh? Topology for beginners. For beginners, okay, great. Okay. It's, it's topology. I don't know the cost for topology for beginners. Okay. Topology. Very interesting. Very interesting. Okay, so without further ado, let's give it to Asar and Imran. Okay, just before that, I had asked permission that I would talk about my wife today yes. because this is the anniversary of her day, the first anniversary. And I wanted to just uh, briefly mention about her. So with your permission, I will start off with that. And that is that she was born in 1954. And uh, she then did her BA in 1972 after having got married and with some difficulties because her son was born immediately after the exam, Ali uh, Khadim. And then that's in 73, she actually, uh, yeah, 73, she did her uh, BA. And in 74, her younger son was born, Usman uh, Khadim. And then she did her MA in 1976, actually, but it was the session that was for 1975, immediately after the BA, that was the first one. And then she uh, started teaching at the Islamabad Model College for Boys in G6 on an ad hoc basis. <laughs> Later, she did the uh, postgraduate diploma of English language uh, uh, teaching, uh, teaching English as a foreign language from the Open University in 1982. And then she joined the uh, Islamabad College for Girls, where she stayed till the time. Uh, and then she went with me, accompanied me to America once, and then to Saudi Arabia, where she first did some private tuition. Then she was teaching at Shakriya, Minaret Shakriya, and did extremely well there. And then she came back with me, and we again went to Saudi Arabia in 2000, and then from 2000 to 2002, she taught at the Daman College. At the Islamabad College for Girls, she rose from lecturer to assistant professor, to associate professor, to professor, and uh, she was vice uh, principal when she retired. She um, was in high demand for various projects that the British Council 
and the UNDP were conducting, and she worked with them. She had to go to England to help with the uh, Pakistani immigrants there. It was the Dali project. And then with the UNDP for various uh, uh, projects that they wanted to be conducted in Islamabad at a college. She acquired a certificate in horticulture. She ran the Asia Study Group for films and for literature. She was a superb cook, incidentally, there, in addition to that. Uh, when she died, and the post was put up at the uh, ICG, in one day there were 1,200 uh, comments of that. Um, she did teach at ICG for a little while after uh, retirement, and then she joined Fatma Jinnah Women University as a visiting uh, teacher there uh, for teaching English literature. And she had to finally give that up when she had been diagnosed with stomach cancer and she knew she couldn't manage to continue there further. But she had taken up uh, work, charity work with the SOS villages for uh, managing uh, schools in three regions. They have their village to be run and the schools there. And she was managing that for Muzaffarabad and Ravnakot and Islamabad. Uh, and she managed to get an enormous uh, donation for SOS Village a short while before she died. But even on the day she died, she was on the phone uh, advising about what's to be done for that. She was remarkable in many ways and to commemorate her, I wanted to just read that out. Now I can get on with the book for uh, topology for beginners for the talk at Pied. It was by Nur Muhammad and me and Israel and Ran Perwez. Uh, could you stand up for a moment and let everybody see you? I'm not showing uh, Nur Muhammad because he passed away about 16 years ago. So we can't dig him up. So here goes with the introduction. Let me start it this way, that you would be asking, why should there be a talk on a book on topology of all subjects at Pine? And the simple answer that I give is that the Vice Chancellor of Pine asked me to give the talk. From your side, let me say, it's all very well, but what relevance does it have? After all, PIDE is for economics. And topology is a branch of pure mathematics. Anyhow, there are many introductory books on topology. Why talk for this one? My answer is, now you've asked two questions. And there are two long answers to these. So tighten your seat belts and settle down to listen. And blame the game afterwards if you find them too long in boring. Topology is a branch of mathematics. On the other side, let me say, well, I already knew that. It deals with relations between the elements of a set. On the other side, I can see it sarcastically. That is informative. It prepares me to write my PhD thesis on topology. It is 
concerned with what is near and not, not near, with multiply connected spaces and whether spaces are equivalent in a fundamental way, more sarcastically. That actually tells me something. Well, it's called rubbishy geometry. On your side, I think that's a fair comment. We obviously started off wrong there, trying to define what topology is without its context. So I could have started off with the history of the development of topology, and that would have made sense. I could have started off with how it is used, and that would have made some sense. I could have listed all the subjects in which it is used, though that would not have made much sense. It would have still conveyed a lot more than the first slide did. Or I could explain why it should be talked of in economics. And that would convey much more information to this audience. I can't simply talk of the subject the subject has to be in the context of who it is addressed to. And so that is the first thing that I want to do. The first justification for talking of topology and economics is that it is part of the standard requirement for mathematics for economists. I used to teach mathematics for economists here at Pride, and so I know. Of course, this begs the question of why it is so required. You see, it is at the base of calculus, and calculus is heavily used in economics. But more importantly, and much more importantly, actually, it is really needed to understand optimization theory properly. How? You see, one can not only find the possible optimal points for a function where it reaches the maximum value, the objective function, that's the value, but one can also find the optimal function for a given purpose. Now that is where it is really used. One would have to be able to define, that's what missed here, well, to state what is best, uh, meant by best function for any context, and if that best function even exists. Let me explain this further. You see, here this is the typical curve for uh, calculus where you get uh, extrema, there'll be a local minimum and a local maximum, and maybe a global minimum where in the given interval it is lowest, or a global maximum which may either be inside or on the boundary. Now, I'm sure that you've all studied this in your mathematics for economists. So, local and global maxima and minima, and in this example, you see that there's one that comes on the boundary. And I, you will draw your attention more to that. If the boundary is excluded, then no global minimum maximum exists. Now, instead of just that curve, there's a domain, and you're going to optimize your uh, objective function over the whole domain. Now, if it is on this D, then there's no problem anyhow. If it's in the interior part, no problem. But supposing the feasible set is not D, but the inside of D, leave out the red line around. It's in the interior, not on the boundary. In that case, there'll be no extreme. Now further, I was talking about whole functions and not just point. So let me ask here, is G of X closest or 
is is this h of x or this k of x to this f of x here, which is the closest. Yeah. Now it depends on how you define closer. For a point in a domain, you get one optimal easily. That's there. But for a curve, it depends on how we define the closeness of function. If it is by the average root mean square difference, then gx is the closest to f of x. And note, gx goes shooting up there, but it's practically lying along f x all the way and way. But if it is by the magnitude of the difference, then obviously this is not, and k of x would be. But if I ask that it should be closest but less than f of x, f of x must be more than what you get to in any case. Then, of course, it would be h of x. So you have to tell me what it is that your requirement is. Then only can I say how we will decide to measure. Because you see, it will depend. You're saying I want to get as close as I can, but never exceed. Unlike Pakistan, I don't want to overspend my budget. I'm not ready to take loans. I'd like to get as close to spending the budget as I can. All institutions should be trying to spend totally up to where they can, as close as they can. But never exceeding. That would have been H of X. Or I could say, well, they'll understand. I take a little bit yes, and pay it back. And then it would be K of X. On average, I've done that. It depends on what I want to do. Let me say that for the for Neumann general equilibrium model, this actually creates a problem. But whichever way you go would create a problem. You can't stay on the perfect path, and then it's not perfect. Whatever you do is going to cause inflation. Well, if there are many criteria for each of which we want the best, it is generally the case that there will be none. There will always be a trade-off between some of the criteria. If within the given constraints there is one only, we say that is Pareto optimal. I'm sure everybody would have heard of Pareto optimal solution. If there's only a limited number of options and the Pareto optimal is not available in the feasible set, then we have to go to the second best. Is what is called the theory of the second best choice. The question certainly arises how far can a second best be defined, leave alone found? Now that's where topology comes in. Second best seems to suggest that there are only a limited number of possibilities available. However, when it comes to choosing paths, there are generally infinitely many available. How do we deal with that? On your behalf, let me say, it is so difficult to deal with infinity. You may try heady. Well, the topology book teaches you how to deal with infinity without a heady, without the need for taking paradox. That is another reason that topology is relevant, provided it is taught properly, which is where the matter of the choice of the book will come in. Let me go on. I've talked about economics. Let me go for a little bit of social science beyond economics, but still related to economics. Now, it may be news for you that there are significant social sciences other than economics. Like physicists, economists tend to be arrogant about the importance of their science, 
as compared with any others, hey, this is the important one. Well, consider geography and its relevance in economic history. Why and how did conflicts and coalitions arise in earlier times? Surely relevant to economic history. It was because there was trade and or attempts at conquest. These occurred where there were land trade routes, which require contiguity, which are abutting each other, or you have to face hazardous journeys by sea. And in those days, sea journeys were dangerous, it was risky. And if your idea was to get a lot of benefits in trade, you were taking high risks to get the benefits. So then the cost benefit has to be looked at. Directly relevant for this is the question then of how many regions can be mutually contiguous or joining, connected together. That will limit the size of your coalition. If the route goes through any other region, the dynamics of the relationship change. So if you want to have the trade agreement all working in those days, you need contiguity, you need that it shouldn't go through any other region, you get directly to the region. This brings us to the four color problem. It was noticed that in all maps, only up to four regions were contiguous. That means having some common boundary. Not at a point, but a boundary where they touch each other. <coughs> Requiring that different regions be different colors to distinguish the regions, you need only need four colors. Let me make the point, not at point, why not at point, even a point as far as countries are concerned, will have some little boundary and you could go through. But if this is so and there are hostile regions in your side, you can't go through. This is in those days when you actually needed sufficiently large land routes to be available. Otherwise, you'd be trapped and that would be the end. When Britain tried to go through to control Afghanistan, they were unable to because they didn't have enough of a land route available and the tribals could pick them off one by one, which they did. So Britain with all its power was not able to handle that. <coughs> so we needed that they about. Was this just a limitation of the types of maps that had been made so far? Or could there be, have been more than four contiguous regions? That would determine the size of coalitions that could have formed in those days. This was one of the problems that led to the development of topology. And it gives the surprising result that whereas for a plain map, there are only four, Globally, there could have been five only. Let me explain the four color problem on the plane. You see, here's this plane E. And there are A, B, C, D, and you can check A, B, C, D are all connected. They all join each other somewhere. Four mutually contiguous regions, A, B, C, D, on the plane E. Notice that E does not about B. You can't get it. Five cannot be and only four. And one can prove this using topology. Actually, I tried to prove this. I got to the basic point of how it should work. And it required a process of elimination. And I left it there that this is not going to work out for me. And only the computer understands the proof. 
And it won't tell us what how the proof moves. Now here's the four color problem on the sphere. E is no longer the plane, it is a sphere. And I can actually go through the sphere. So I give a proof by counterexample that you can go for more than four. The four mutually contiguous regions are on the Earth, E, from a place on E, and one can make a tunnel to B from E, and then get E and B contiguous as well. So you see over here, there was this B and E were not contiguous. Now the computer had done 1200 computer hours, and then we can't get it to tell us how, how that actually works. It just go through this and that's the answer that comes out. But this, of course, you can see. The theorem for a plane does not hold on a sphere. The counter example is worth a thousand proofs. So let us shift our attention to sociology. John Donne had said, no man is an island entire of itself. But that's not strictly true. There are jogis and hermits who live as total recluses. A scientific theory of society must explain and describe a social behavior as well as understanding how and why society forms and why there are antisocial elements in all societies. Well, the general understanding is that society formed as an extension of the family, which acquired closeness to survive in hostile surroundings. From the family emerged the clan, from the clan emerged the tribe, from the tribe emerged the society. It is taken for granted that our biological urge to replicate our genes leads us to put ourselves first, then our closest relatives who will carry likely most of our genes, Usman there will carry half of my genes, so that's close. That's as close as one could get unless there was intermarriages and so on. Then, then, then. So this is how it would go, and so on as you go, more distant relatives would carry less. His son would carry a quarter of my genes. My brother would carry half, but my cousin would carry a quarter. So it would go that way, you could just go on and it would become less and less and you have more close by and less further away. Now, antisocial behavior can be understood because it is consistent with the above requirement of putting ourselves first, maximum number of the same gene. Till of course you're no longer reproducing, then you want your son to go on. That will carry your genes through for your sons, so you have most of your genes going through. But why should there be a social behavior? And that brings in topology. To begin to answer the question, you need to describe it first. And our usual idea of close and distant comes from the usual geometrical measure of distance. But you can see this is not a geometrical measure of distance. The uh, topology associated with this measure is called, wait for it, surprise, surprise, the usual topology. Uh, you say, why is that so different? Well, what we need is an unusual topology. The usual topology won't work. 
to proceed further, I need to now define what a topology is, not at the start, but here. It is the set of all those subsets of the chosen universal set that are regarded for some purpose as open. I so define that, that is open. What is ch chosen to be taken as open is arbitrary, subject to the requirement that the union of open sets is open, a finite intersection of open sets is open, and the whole set and empty set are sets of members of the topology. Incidentally, the subject of topology is the study of how different topologies are chosen and how they relate to each other and what properties characterize them, such as whether the space has all parts deformable to each other without breaking them or not. There's one which has a very uninteresting name that I will give here, which I am calling the Christian topology. Everybody is close. All are close. That is it. Then there's another topology with another uninteresting name. They like to keep their technical names uninteresting. So I'm going to call it the Muslim topology. All the Ummah is the uh, is close and all not in the Ummah are far. There's another one in which all elements not in a given set are equally close and those in that set are equally distinct. This could be regarded as an enemy topology. That is out and the rest will be in. Russia is out if I'm in gray. There's the discrete topology according to which no one else is close. I, me, I am the only thing. All others are equally distinct. The totally selfish asocial topology. Nobody else matters. I alone matter. So I read the relevant spot and go on to why this book. So let's address this book. You've seen how I presented up to here, starting with the first slide, in an informal way. Well, that's the way the book presents. You see, from the first slide, I say, start with that approach, and then this is the wrong approach. I first demonstrated that's wrong. And then I start trying to do better. You see, the usual style of textbooks of topology is to give definitions, then theorems, then proofs, then example or two, and then move on to the next theorem. Different definition, theorem, proof. And unless you were really interested in learning topology, I can't see that anybody would manage to do but mind you, I haven't managed to kind of keep uh, the names again. She is dropped off. <laughs> so here in the book, we follow a totally different approach. For example, on the first page, we explain the point as follows. A mother is telling her son what a chair is. The mother says, the chair is something with four legs. So the son points to the cat. You mean that? No, dear, not that. Not the cat. It's something you sit on. So the son is trying to sit on his dog. He says, you mean rover? No, no, son. Not rover, but something you can sit on for long times. The son now feels, now I followed it. Is that. You mean that pony I know? Mother less patiently. No, no, it is man-made. Some tiring of the guessing game points to the floor. You mean that? And mother definitely irritated by now. Why are you being so slow today? Pointing to a chair. I mean that. The parent would have been well advised to have started by pointing to some chairs. And then to some objects that are not chairs, 
to provide for a field of what a chair is. It is not enough to define something or even to explain by examples what it is, but also to explain by counterexamples what it is not. That is the approach that we follow. The book not only is giving the material, it not only gives the motivation, it not only gives examples, it not only gives counterexamples, it gives the basis for providing the explanation as it is provided in the book. That is not the way of usual textbooks. And it is totally not the way the topology textbooks are. On page seven to eight of this book, which was shown there, let me show it here. It explains the seven bridges problem of Konigsberg, which is one of the things that is regarded as the birth of topology. So the section starts as follows. Long, long ago, far, far away, I hope you have seen Star Wars, the original Star Wars, the lighting running in front of you that way. Uh, in the 17th century, that doesn't sound so long ago, in, when the Earth was in attendance on the Sun, so that's where this distance is coming in, roughly a fifth of a light year back in the galaxy, because the Sun is moving. Two noblemen are standing near a bridge in France. The view pans out and we see seven bridges connecting two islands in a river to two shores and each other. The, the view closes in again and we see the two talking. First noble. But our man, I tell you, it is impossible, totally impossible to start on one island and return to it, having crossed all seven bridges without recrossing one. Armand, not questioning the importance or relevance of crossing all bridges in this manner. But Ari, you just have not tried doing it the right way. Of course, it must be possible. Ari says, I spent all night trying. Had it been possible, I would surely have found it, wouldn't I? Armand, no, you Ari. I doubt that very much. And he says then, are you both saying I'm a fool? A man with a sneer on his face, no, I'm saying you're a dunderhead and an idiot. Do you imagine this? This is a book of topology textbook. Ari pulling off his glove and slapping our man's face with it. I challenge you to prove that you can cross the bridges. And he draws his sword. Our man drawing his own sword salutes with it and says, I will. This is our duty. Now the camera moves back and we see two not so noble men. Not so noble, but a whole lot more sensible. One draws out a piece of paper, the other a pencil. And I ask you to excuse the anachronism of the pencil there. And both start to draw a diagrammatic representation of the bridges and land mass masses. And thus is topology woven. And that's the diagram. Okay, so this is the way the book goes. It introduces the problem and then goes on to point set topology. So having got through all of that in not too long, I hope, I trust I've convinced you that topology is relevant for economics and many other social sciences. And this is a good book to explain it. Now, if you are still not convinced and have some queries or disagreements, please raise them now or 
as they say, at the end of the Christian marriage, forever hold your peace. A hand of your thing. Excellent. I'm going to certainly be happy to answer questions now or afterwards. You can ask me by email if you have any. Thank you. So, sir, I think the very good presentation, very intuitive. But the choosing by the topology has certainly found its place. And as you explained, the marathon of the interface topology is the of optimization in here. Sorry? Yep. Our interface, the economist interface with topology is only in the optimization process. We think of optimizing certain spaces, you know, trying to figure out what the consumer demand, what the supply, etc. is. Um, but topology is more widely used in, in every area. So give us an example of, um, for example, how topology is being used in the real world. Um, in the internet, the topology and topological uh, presentations are the end, trying to find out topology of the internet and you're know, trying to figure out. Well, so, it's come on, I thought I'd explain where you have many variables and you have to select not the best possible point, but the best possible path, which means the best possible policy. You're going to take a policy for whatever monetary, fiscal, etc., which will be your control variables. And then finally, you want the best possible path. Ideally, you would like a phenomenon growth and that would be the best possible path. Unfortunately, that won't be available. It won't be in the feasible set. How do I find the best that I can find? The theory of the choice, second best choice. That comes with topology only. Of course, I need to explain topology further to be able to explain how that is used. This is where it is getting used for functional analysis, which is used for optimization of parts. So but then would you say that what we do in calculus is a subset of topology? So you would no, calculus what we do, for example, is simply optimizing a function, and we do it's it not a subset of all of mathematics. There will be that it gets used somewhere or the other, and quite often the mathematics will be used in more mathematics, which will be used in more mathematics. So, in one sense, I could say that well, all of functional analysis is calculus. But it isn't because functional analysis is in some ways really linear algebra, but not really quite. So I I need topology to be able to do functional analysis properly. When I'm going to work with it, particularly I, I'm trying to find the optimal path, then I really would like to know what can be done, particularly if it isn't a finite horizon optimal path. What about when I say it is an infinite time horizon? Now it's going to become a very tricky question. There are ways of trying to deal with it, but the question really requires that one looks at what are the possible things that you're going to want to avoid. I say this seems to be the best possible path up to here. And then I let it go further. And then I see that as it goes further, there is a possibility that it diverges totally, leads to total instability. Somewhere in the future. Maybe I can push the future further and further. But somewhere or the other, total instability is going to arise. For example, in the financial market. If that is so, then we run into a crunch, and then another crunch, and then another, and then another, and then another. And then you go on with the question, the crunches. Is topology a static analysis or can we have dynamic? This is to do with the functional analysis when you go into the infinite time horizon, you'd have to be able to say 
what it is that you're saying I will exclude. Now, for that, you have to be able to tell me what the type of space is. That's where we'll have to go to topology. That's one example, but that's not the only example. I can give you different examples. Okay, let me ask you, I, I once saw a book or an article I've forgotten, which is talking about the topology of the internet. The uh, topology of? Of the internet. Uh, how would you apply topology to the internet? The internet is a vast space. With, to the internet. To the internet. I mean, internet is a vast space with Google, etc., so many other things in there. How do you apply topology there? Well, I need to explain a little bit more of topology to properly explain this. I'll try to do so quickly in a quick answer. You see, if you wanted, you could enter this room by coming through one door directly, which was the one that Usman brought me through, or I could have gone the other side and then come to this. These are two distinct parts and cannot be slightly deformed from one to the other. So this space is a multiply connected space. It, there are many different parts which are in equivalent. Now, supposing I have different connections, it will be like going in the rooms of five. You'll have different places that you can connect in different ways. Now, look for all possible ways that you can connect. That will generate various benefits and various problems. The benefit, of course, is that you can get from one place to the other in many different ways and find your way straight. But it means that you have so much more to look for. When I have this whole vibe, all the possible parts, if I have to go through and see now which would be the best, it may become more of a problem to go through all that. The internet is an extremely multiply connected space. It so far certainly remains finite dimension because there are a finite number of uh, points at where it is, so it will be, uh, but it will be everything connected to everything else in many different ways. Look at the networks that you have even in Pied, and you can have them connected in different ways. But then I could go further and exclude something from somewhere. Uh, Nadim's internet should not be accessible for the ordinary people because there'll be secret things out there. So that has to be kept separate. There's Usman is able to put his own little bit separate, he keeps it separate, but then he wants also to be able to mix in with everybody else, so then he keeps the rest open, but then so do you, so does he, so do you, she, it's a, everybody is doing their own, and now what is the technology of that space, and I'm only talking of Pied, which is a small room, how many you have a hundred or something uh, people using computers. Researchers, fifty other staff, two hundred. Who use computers? So now, how many different possible parts do I have? One hundred and fifty factorial, roughly. Of course, it won't be that much. I can go with two just by two, so then it would be. 150 C, C2, yeah. which is 150 times 149 and, uh, divided by sure. 2. That will be 8. But you see, it's not only 2. You'll have 3 way. Yeah, 3 way, 4 way, 5 way. 4 way. Yeah. Okay, yeah, the webinar. Not only here it goes out. No, it's only going out, it isn't receiving. But if this is 
fully on Zoom, then if somebody wants to ask a question, it is also receiving. What's the topology? Very relevant because I have to be able to find an algorithm which makes it fast enough for anybody to for us from anywhere to anywhere. Those algorithms that have to be produced will be produced taking into but, uh, account. You know, you, you heard about this saying that the six degrees of separation that across the world, sociologists have calculated that across the world, everybody is connected to everybody with six degrees of separation. So I can connect to Obama or Clinton with six moves. And same thing on the internet, the diameter of the internet is seen to be 19. So the internet, you can take 19 hops, you can get from one to the other. Yes. And as what you said, that's part of the body. It's yeah. going to be absolutely enormous. This problem of the of network connectedness arose first actually, uh, oddly enough, in uh, the high energy physics laboratory uh, in CERN. Uh, because they had to deal with enormous amounts of data, which if they were to handle one at a time, it would be impossible in the same way. That's just not going to happen. So they had to parcel it off to different people. But then you parcel it off, but they must be able to then connect it back together, to separate it and brought it back together. It was still a very limited thing. But then it could go to the type of thing on the internet, and it becomes very much more connected. The connectedness is one of the things that you study in topology. Uh, my question comes again from the question of my uh, vice chancellor. So when we talk about six degrees of separation, I am six degrees away from the current prime minister. I meet six right people, I'm there. But when I study as a social scientist, when I was looking at your slides, I'm not a very stable entity like a number. So if I look to Martin Ruber, so I'm I, and I can also be a thou. So how does math or topology understand the phenomena which itself is continuously changing while trying to reach that? Well, let's say that when you were saying, I'm not quite following what the problem is, but let me see if I follow it. That when, as a social scientist, you're saying things are not that yeah. clearly separated, Fine, yeah. out, then how do we work with it? And I had given an answer to a deal in something that actually is related, but perhaps you didn't see that. When I talked about going to the infinite time horizon in optimization, it isn't well defined. Risks arise. How big a risk has to be regarded as unacceptably big? How one in a one in a trillion, one in a billion, what? What we're talking about depends on who determines is it the whole world that's going? Are you ready to go on a chance of one in a billion? Now you see, yeah. where I'm dealing with the number of uh, people not well yeah. defined. Yes, the same problem. I have to deal with un uncertain things. My space has to be such. Which I can do to produce How am I going to do that? Now, this depends. There is that method which is used to say I'm dealing with randomness. I'll take stochastic movements and randomly determine. Then I will use the, the measure of extended deviation see how that can go. But what if I'm going out of the bounds of something complete? The same thing that will apply in any social context. When you want to deal with it, you need to deal with it. 
For example, I gave you the topology for the, what I said, the Muslim topology. All here are closed, all others. Out. Now, if I have that type of topology, I'm saying well enough defined, all the others can be destroyed. I don't know. I have to submit this community very small. When it gets applied to political situation today, the whole country can go so long as Imran Khan can survive, PTI can survive, PML can survive. Let the country drown if we have to survive. Do we want a political system that will let Pakistan down or do we like to change the political system? I'm talking about the space center to be available. To get rid of this system, how do you know? You need to think in the same type of terms with uncertainty where you may not want to use random planning, where you may want to allow for more flexibility than random planning. But remember where there was no mathematics which would explain why there would be cooperation between individuals. John Nash provided the thing, and there was an explanation of how cooperation perhaps it was. If you have no uh, mathematics that deals with the problem that you are interested in, then it is your job to make the mathematics that will deal. And the basic subjects that we use will include the technology. Janine, thank you very much, Vasab. And looking at the book, you said beginners, but it's still <laughs> quite an ask. It's still quite an ask. It still requires a lot of effort to read, I think. Um, but I can see there's going to be a lot of interesting stuff to look at. Um, and I can see. Lots of interesting dimensions. In the end, let me just remind you that you introduced me to a book a long time ago called The Foundation. And just now, a new um, television series has come out based on that book. It's uh, on Apple. I don't know if you've seen it or not. But um, all this brings to my mind psycho history. And uh, would you like to just tell people about that a little bit and how it relates to topology? Because I think there is a connection there. Hmm. Do, I, do I need to give an answer to that? Uh -huh. Just tell people about psychohistory foundation. Mm -hmm. Just tell people about psychohistory and foundation and how it connects there. <laughs> foundation? Foundation. That's about the foundation, anything. No, 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 psychohistory, anything. Psychohistory connects to this, doesn't it? Asimov's foundation. Isaac Asimov. Isaac Asimov foundation. Ah, the Isaac Asimov foundation. Yeah. I was thinking. I don't know if you remember or not. You okay, let me just say that my interest in economics started actually because of the science fiction trilogy that I read. By the way, it's become ten books since then. I hope you know. That. That's. That is the book, the Foundation Trilogy, and in that there is, the plot is that there is now a galactic empire, and in the galactic empire there are an enormous number of planets, and within them the planets an enormous number, of, the population an enormous at each planet, so you can use statistics very well. And the type of question that was asked then of trying to make predictions and using yeah. the statistical method, he goes with. And there is uh, the central character at that time in some sense, Harry Seldon, who finds this method, the mathematics that we then explain 
and he predicts that the galactic civilization will collapse in so much time. And with that prediction, he goes further. He plans that there should be then somewhere where the civilization can rebuild it. And he provides the seed for that to, to rebuild. And then with the realization of what I was just talking about, that things can go arbitrarily wrong, that there must be then another seed, a second foundation, which will ensure that the foundation stays on track and thereby tries to get the development going. And according to the, that trilogy, it works out. Of course, there is a problem with that. The same problem that we're facing now and which he had allowed for to some extent, that you have the foundation, which is the watcher. Who will watch the watcher? And that was the second foundation. But it is an endless regress. Who will watch the second foundation? And that is where he has just left it. He has it. it is an endless regress. But the point that I think Vivian wanted me to stress is that the mathematics that can be developed, there's no limit to if you use. So long as the base of your mathematics is good, you know how to develop any new mathematics. Statistics did not come on its own in the beginning. It was developed to deal with uncertainties. In fact, the ultimate uncertainty of gambling. That's where it was originally developed from. And then it got developed beyond and more. Game theory, I mentioned. Topology, I've just been talking about. Mathematics has been developed. People talk about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics, how it manages to give everything. I believe there isn't anything unreasonable about it. Mathematics is developed by us, for us. And when we have particular problems, we develop that mathematics that will deal with those problems. We developed calculus, we developed set theory, we developed whichever. We'll go on developing, provided we know how to develop. And we are not going to rely on the Americans to tell us how to do it. No, but there's a, there's a further problem. So, do we develop mathematics or does it exist outside us? And we just discover it. I mean, I would think that you would argue that, um, you know, the mathematics, as again, under the famous instance, Stephen Hawking said, mathematics exists in the mind of God. And we just discover it. I disagree with that. My feeling is we create the mathematics. We create it according to our needs. When game theory was developed, it was not discovered. John Nash had a particular problem. The economic theory at the time said competition, competition, competition. In that base, you can't have cooperation. There will be the prisoner's dilemma. When you have what I'd given as the totally selfish economy, that's the American idea, the totally selfish. Me for myself, and when it comes to it, I'll send my grandmother down the river. But didn't we need that selfish paradigm? Mm -hmm. well, didn't we need that selfish paradigm for our calculus? No, we need it was separation. In a particular context, in a particular time, but then it goes wrong. If we come to discuss that particular point, then what was originally in America was that they would 
be ready to lay down their lives for their family, their city, and for America. And they, they were very happy doing that. Till Adam Smith says, a rational man maximizes his profit. Sorry, all who females are now left out. The rational man maximizes his profit. Well, even if all rational people are going to, we assume that women can be rational. Adam Smith would disagree, but I believe that women are rational. So let's go with that. All rational people will maximize their profit. Is this an observation and a statement of a law? You see, if I, well, I won't drop that. If I drop this, it will fall, and that's a law of gravity that it can fall like this. Is it a law that everybody will maximize, rational people will maximize their thought? It's an observation. Is it a valid observation? Or is it a self-fulfilling observation? Once I say the rational person will maximize their government, now if you believe me, you feel that when you are not maximizing your profit, you are being irrational. You don't want to be irrational. So you start maximizing your profit. So if you get a chance to go abroad, you go abroad, rather than staying here and serving your country. But if you were ready to sacrifice for your country, then you'd stay here. Did Adam Smith actually discover that law or create that law? Was it a good observation or a bad judgment? That is what is leading us to the present problem with the climate change and pollution over consumption. It is there, we have no doubt about what is happening. We can see it in Pakistan with the current floods. It is a direct consequence of the climate change. And we know that it has gone wrong. It is coming wrong, why? Because of that. So I don't accept that assumption that this was why it should be done. We should maximize our profit. We shouldn't. We maximize our good in the long run. But how long a run? Well, I certainly want it longer than my life, which presumably should not be very much more. I want it to be for all of his life, this is where it's going into what I was talking about, the closeness. But his son and daughter, I wanted to go for them. So my horizon has now gone forward to something like about 70 years. I can't really identify with their children. But they will be there. And he will be dealing with that. And not only will he be dealing with that, his children will be dealing with the thing further. Now, if I had empathy, I will be thinking still further. So I just don't accept that it is that type of simplification is a sound one. This is the point that was being made with the social sciences not having that definite limit. When it isn't that definite limit, now what? Well, you have to find better ways to do. But John Nash found a better way than Adam Smith had, which explained how uh, cooperation developed. And let's face it, cooperation develops with chimpanzees. Tribes of chimpanzees cooperate. It is not something that only humans do. So we need to look at it more deeply and not say, Hazrat Adam Smith ne kaidiya. 
Jalini, thank you very much. First half, it's been a great pleasure as always. It's a pleasure to listen to you and argue with you. We shall continue it socially, but uh, I think people have got a great dose of mathematics today, which is absolutely imperative and important. I thank you for coming up to us. Right. Thank you very much for putting this in our library. You, you allow want us to? Us? Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much. I remember Ramya very well. Thank you. All the best to you. Thank you.